evening, everyone. I'm glad that you're all here for the uh, lecture this evening. Uh, uh, this lecture series has been very successful for a lot of people because we've covered a wide range of subjects. Tonight is especially interesting dealing with Civil War medals, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of history with it and some humor. We done had the humor earlier today, but Greg can tell you about how to claim a Vancouver medal. <laughs> okay. A little uh, housekeeping. Uh, coming up, featuring Dr. Ken Bailey, we've got a post-Civil War legal issues uh, presentation. It, it's called Scratch em and Sue em. And you'll see little things at the end of the table on that presentation. <coughs> Coming up in November, on November 8th, Patricia McClure will be doing a presentation on the 1942 WVU Championship Basketball Team, A Tale for Veterans Day, and she's going to tell about how many people on that team was in World War II, and it should be a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, do keep uh, a check on our web page because uh, we post what our upcoming events are and I do hope that you look at that regularly. We have some very exciting things coming up even later in October this year. So I will now introduce tonight's speaker. Greg Carroll will present applying for a Civil War medal. Uh, he will tell you what you need to do to claim one. You'll get some Civil War history along the way. Uh, we ended up with thousands of medals uh, that were unclaimed, and he will go into detail about that. Greg Carroll is a graduate of Marshall University and is a staff historian here at the Archives and History Library. He's worked here over 23 years, and he's been working with Civil War medal claims for uh, over 20 years, and uh, Greg specializes in Civil War history. He also deals a great deal with Native American history and African American history. Uh, sadly enough, uh, when, when an employee retires, they are replaceable. Everyone is replaceable. But always remember that a fountain of knowledge goes with them. And that will go with Greg when he retires later this month. So make welcome to Greg Carroll. section of our website, which I will advertise later on, too. I'm glad you could make it this evening. I, I will be talking about the Civil War medals that we have left in our collection upstairs. They're all nicely locked up there. And I'll give you some inside tips, hopefully, to make your application successful. Many of you may have already applied for a medal, received one. You may have uh, heard that somebody said there was metals down here and are coming up here curious. Naturally, uh, these metals are for the family members of Union soldiers in regular regiments. So that leaves out, of course, all the Confederates, and that leaves out the Union militiamen that there were thousands and thousands of also. The Union militia soldiers did not get medals or pensions, I might add. Uh, but before doing that, I can't resist the opportunity, you know, to try to stir you all up a little bit. Other people tend to avoid controversy, not me. I don't avoid controversy. I try to bring it up 
And we're going to do that because I'm going to talk about the metals, why they were produced, and the political climate that brought about the creation of the state of West Virginia. As you know, our state was created by the people of the western part of old Virginia when their fellows in Richmond decided that it would be a good idea to break away from the once United States and establish a confederacy of states. These confederated states happened to be found all across the southern section of the once United States and they just happen to all use slave labor as their main economic system. I'm one of those historians who actually will stand up and tell you straight out that this was a very bad idea for the people of Virginia. And I will vociferously defend and applaud those brave Western Virginians who also recognized this reality and were willing to sacrifice and place themselves and their people in jeopardy to remain loyal to the United States. The slave system advocated by this new confederacy was naturally a cruel and despotic economic process that kept in bondage and forced servitude millions of black people. Slavery was also a dead-end labor style, shown to be unproductive and socially costly compared to free labor. Those progressive Southerners, and there were many progressive Southerners, who attempted to improve the South by advocating free labor and industrial development were shouted down by a rich and entrenched minority of cotton empire agriculturalists. The forward-thinking men and women who created the new state of West Virginia were just the sort of progressive Southerners that were sick and tired of being controlled by this landed gentry aristocracy. They were mainly found along the Ohio River, the folks that uh, formed our new state. <clears throat> they, uh, they were in the new counties that were burgeoning with new industries and based on free labor. These men and women decided that the time had come to remove themselves from the yoke of unfair taxation and backward political practices that had kept our part of Virginia down for so long. I also want to say that there was a strong, loyal faction across the southern part of our area. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, that did not own slaves and was not connected to the political elite in Richmond. Uh, an example would be to look at the farmers right here around Kanawha County, not the bankers that live downtown. The farmers in these valleys and creeks all around here that joined by the thousands, the Union regiments and the Union militias. We have the lists of them right here. You'll enjoy those. By 1863, this loyal faction was ready to establish the state of West Virginia. We celebrate this event on June 20th each year. Our founding uh, remains controversial to Southern sympathizers, despite the fact that they themselves demanded the right of governmental change. This question, supposedly decided on the battlefield, seems to have never reached a conclusion and even now remains a sore scar on our body politic. We could talk about this subject for hours, days, weeks, years. I hope not centuries, but I think you all know some of the facts I've just been laying out. But be that as it may, uh, the young state legislature wanted to reward their loyal citizens for service well rendered during the recent war. And I think they wanted to amplify the new state identity. So, in 1866, Joint Resolution Number 11 allowed for the design and minting of brass on copper metal. Uh, it was uh, created uh, following the Ohio and the Crimean War design for metals. And this uh, contract was awarded to the New York firm of A. Demarest. 
at 182 Broadway Street. <laughs> the dies were finished by a designer named A.J. Siegel, whose name appears on the obverse of each medal. The price for each medal was not to exceed one dollar. Now these medals, uh, as you can find them online, can go up to fifteen hundred dollars for a killed in battle medal. So uh, I'm sure there are different prices on different uh, uh, medals that have probably are in better condition. But uh, I'm going to show you a uh, little set of these and pass these around so everybody can see them, the real things. These medals are uh, both the uh, medal for soldiers that died from wounds or disease. And this is the most common medal, which I will explain here in a second, which is just the honorable discharge medal. We have the, the other side of the medal on the back here, and on the other side is the best looking medal, which is the killed in battle, a very dramatic scene etched on the, on the killed in battle medal, which I have a picture of here, but in fact I passed those out. Uh, let's pass these around let you look at them. You can see each medal has a top and a red, white, and blue ribbon. So uh, let's pass that around so you can take a look at the things. Uh, you'll notice, but you can't quite see it unless you really look close. On the edge of the medal, each soldier has his name embossed, literally, on the edge of the medal. His name and you, uh, sometimes rank and sometimes, uh, well, most of the time, company and regiment. So, uh, some people always ask, well, listen, I, my, he, my medal got given away early. Uh, why don't you give me a replacement medal? You know, each medal is individual. There are no replacement medals. So, they're one of a kind with a soldier's name embossed on the edge of each one. Unfortunately, sometimes the name is misspelled, but that's the way that goes. Uh, there were three classes decided upon. You can see them in the picture I just passed out to you. Type 1 is the Honorably Discharged Medal. There were 22,098. By far, that is the most common medal. Unfortunately, uh, a guy could have had typhoid while he was in the Army and then died two years later. But he didn't get a died from wounds or disease medal. He got the usual Honorable Discharge Medal. Type 2 is the rare one, the killed in battle medal. There were 778 of those made. They are very impressive. And if you'll look at the picture uh, on your uh, little sheet there I passed out, you'll see, uh, oh, the officer on horseback leading a charge there. It looks like the bayonet charge is going on. They're giving them the cold steel right there. So you can see uh, how dramatic the killed in battle uh, uh, looks uh, later if you can't see it very well we can see it on these two which is a photograph of the metals themselves and that way you can take a look at this one here she's passing out the uh, the actual case of metals there uh, the last metal is type 3 and that is listed as for liberty there were 3223 of these metals and that was meant for soldiers that died from wounds or disease. Uh, this brings up an interesting point that I have made before. Y'all may have heard me say it before. Very few soldiers died from bullets or bayonets. Thousands of soldiers. More than double, more than usually triple the number of men that die in combat are soldiers that die from typhoid and measles and dysentery and influenza and those kind of things. You look at the uh, list of the uh, regiments when they have their casualties listed at the back of, the, of a list, you know, always triple. The guys that die from disease are, um, if you say you had uh, 30 men die in uh, battle, you'll see on the list 90 men died from disease, triple. The number. That's why men are afraid to go to the hospital, because that's usually where the disease is. And typhoid uh, ran rampant in both the camps and the hospitals. 
the soldiers uh, oftentimes were young farm boys, 17, 18, 19 years old. They'd come into camp, they'd join the regiment, they'd get the uniform on to look good for the girls, and they're dead from typhoid in three weeks. That's the most common situation that happens. And oftentimes they're buried in graves that are unmarked. So uh, uh, it's just a tragedy of war. I can tell you that it's a painful story if you read it close. Uh, that gave the total of number um, of medals at about 26,099. Each soldier's name, rank, and unit are embossed on the edge. Uh, take a look at, at that at right there and see if you can see the guy's name is on there. Uh, we, uh, we have them on the fourth floor here. We have gone through them several times. I wanted to show you that we have old, old lists. You know, people say, well, when did my medal get given out? Our family doesn't have the medal, you know. Well, it could be any one of these marked out little spots here. Uh, dated and in alphabetical order. So you could look at various lists we have here. These are the oldest, and this list is the most recent. Naturally, online, you can see all our lists, and their uh, soldiers are listed in alphabetical order online. Our website is so easy to reach that even I can do it. And as Pam knows, I can barely turn the computer on. And the situation is very simple. Other people give letterings and addresses. Just go to Google and put in WV State Archives. Our website comes up. That's all you got to do. On that website, you can go to various areas, find Civil War history. Uh, the list itself will be under Civil War, and then it'll be under uh, Civil War Union Medals. And uh, a very simple process to look up and see if your man is still on our most recent list. I hope he is. I hope you find him tonight right here on this list. The older ones you might want to look at to see if your man lost his medal over the past 20, 30 years to that crazy cousin of yours that you always didn't like. He may have gotten that medal. Our problem is, of course, that we have to give these medals out to the folks that apply for it and can prove their relationship. Uh, the, uh, the, the application process itself is not hard, but it's one of those that you want to do it right before you give us your $50. So uh, I was going to say that the, the distribution of the medals, in the very beginning, commenced in September of 1866, and by 1869, over 18,000 had already been issued. In 1881, the State Adjutant General and the GAR, I assume you know those letters are in reference to the Grand Army of the Republic, a Union Soldiers Veterans Group. They uh, again tried to advertise the work at giving out these remaining medals. Uh, at the time, it was reported to be around 3,000. In reality, the state eventually found it had approximately 5,200 medals still in its possession in the 1980s. Uh, we've been working to distribute these uh, up to the present. Uh, I have personally have been responsible for awarding these medals for almost 20 years. Our previous director, Fred Armstrong, had helped to reinitiate this duty by pushing this project strongly. He eventually was able to put this uh, list online and on our website, which uh, I advise you going to look to. And uh, our list is now at around 3,500 left. Still a lot of medals left. We attempt uh, to get on newspaper and TV coverage. We try to go to historical societies. We try to do things like this right now to get this word out. Uh, it seems these days that most folks hear about the medals online when researching their Civil War veterans. That seems to be the, the most prominent way now. Uh, I have some applications here and uh, 
naturally our lists, uh, there is a $50 fee for each application. That price has gone up over the past few years. Uh, folks wonder why so high a cost, and I have to remind them, of course, that we spend hours and hours trying to verify each one of these metal applications because I can assure you my boss, Joe Geiger back there, is not going to pass out any metal unless it is totally verifiable. That way he knows it's going to the correct family. And uh, that's a, that's a, a promise. Uh, we do the best we can with each one. Uh, the uh, official records that you send in with your application do not have to be the real birth certificate or the real birth record. You can always just go to your library and copy them, you know, copy a record if you wish. Uh, they don't have to be the actual documents. But, uh, you know, it's important to realize that people now send us long lists of Ancestry.com nice family histories. These are not what we need. We don't need nice, clear lists of, of computer-generated material because we cannot fully verify each one of those steps without going to our books, going to our microfilm, and uh, having to go through the list ourselves. So don't just send these nice, neat genealogies. Start with yourself, usually your own birth record. Then uh, I advise going to the 1940 census and going straight back. 40, 30, 20, 10, 1900. There is no 1890, burned in a fire. Have you all heard that story? The story I heard may be <laughs> apocryphal, but I'm going to tell you that I heard that the firemen came in and sprayed water all over the 1890 records. And the water began to spoil and ruin the records. And as the people that control this building in D.C., this is back in the sometime in the 1890s, 1900, uh, when they realized that part of the records had spoiled, they were terrified that some of the states that had dry records would get the information, whereas the states that got wet records would not get information. So they took the whole 1890 census out and burned it. <laughs> they burned the whole thing off, which I think was a shame. Naturally, when the senators heard about this, somebody got in trouble. But it was too late to save the 1890 census. And I will tell you right off the bat, I have no idea whether that story is true or not. So if you look it up and I'm all wrong, you can, you can correct me later, okay? I think it's just an interesting story. Uh, you know that we have decided over the past many years of dealing with Joe and I have taken the liberty, I will say, to go up to a certain point in a, a genealogical tree. It is oftentimes great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, and then it switches over to a brother or a mother, naturally. Wives or more husbands are allowed. And as you go up, you can switch down from another side of that family. The problem is, you can't just keep going forever. You know, it's not going to be given to the mother's brother's uncle's servant. It's just not going to happen. The fine line has to be judged by us here, and we will be as fair as possible. But 16th, you know, cousins and a variety of things that Aunt Mary said in her, uh, you know, her family genealogy are not going to be enough to make that connection. So there is a fine <coughs> line. And you can easily ask us, call us, or write us, and we will try to delineate where that line is with your family. But if you see a soldier on this list right here, he has a name that you want to be interested in, I would check that out, because you might find that you are closer than you think. So uh, <coughs> please do so. When you are going through this metal process. It is interesting to note that there are some areas that people don't know about, and I'm going to tell you about one of them. The 1890 Veterans Census. 
This is the part of the census that wasn't stored in that building that burned. This census has the soldiers who were found in the 1890 census, and oftentimes it helps because if they died earlier, their wives are listed. And it tells you what county they live in. Imagine how helpful that is for me when I'm trying to separate two John Williams. You know, there's lots of John Williams, you know. And that helps to delineate what county they may have lived in and what regiment they were in. Uh, from that book, I go to uh, the book that we have right here in the library done by Tim McKinney, a Civil War almanac. He has taken the 1890 census and put it in a form for you. That helps you decide where your soldier was and things like uh, what county and what regiment. And that regiment number really helps. You don't need to worry about what company they're in most of the time. But the regimental number is essential. Because in our list, there are 10, you know, John Johnsons. And on our medals list, you need the John Johnson that's on our list, and that regiment number has to match. That's the process. I use also, uh, I think I can. Uh, see that some of y'all know about this book, the Broadfoot edition helps you decide what soldiers are in the West Virginia regiments. This book is essential and I use it every day. So this helps you decide the Union soldiers in West Virginia. You know, there are John Johnsons that are Confederates and I have to go to the Confederate book too. Because if I find your man in this book, you're not getting a medal. Unless, of course, the Confederates switch sides, which has happened many times, especially when they realized who was going to win. Uh, a lot of Western Virginians that were Confederates uh, end up in the Union Army and end up on that medals list. It always surprises those big uh, Southern supporters when they come in and find out that old granddad so-and-so, that they were just sure fought with Stonewall Jackson, you know, Turns out, no, no, he was in the 5th West Virginia Union Infantry. So uh, that's a big shock to some families. Uh, I'm of the opinion that the best proof is the census records from 1940 clear back to 1850. They're the easiest. They show the children, and they show the ages of the children. So you got people that, that show the dad and the mom and the kids and the ages. That's <coughs> invaluable when it comes to proving who in the 1850 census has a brother who has a child who has a medal, you know, that kind of setup. The uh, census records are especially helpful. Uh, I would remind folks, if they don't know already, that the census records are available right here online in our library for free. But if you have Ancestry.com at home, of course, you can look up any census records you want and uh, just print out the actual census, that'll do. Uh, that shows a whole lot. Uh, the problem with verification uh, often goes back to the 1850 census because as you genealogists may know, the 1840 and on back do not have the names of the wives and the children listed. They have number of white males, uh, one to five. Number of white females, 15 to 20, whatever the numbers are. Uh, so the 1840 census, you begin to run out of uh, good information. So remember that. Uh, it, the use of computer-generated genealogy charts, that can help, but it has to be backed up by real evidence. And uh, oftentimes I tell people just to draw themselves out a simple genealogical tree and that tree can help me and the person that's applying to see where there could be gaps. Uh, remember that uh, many of the soldiers in our West Virginia Union regiments came from Pennsylvania and Ohio. Several thousand soldiers were in Pennsylvania and Ohio and suddenly all their regiments were filled up. 
Uh, the young men assumed that the war would be over in six weeks. They filled up quickly all the regiments they could. The war was going to end immediately, you know, because that obviously wasn't going to last. It was going to be over. They had no idea what was in store. As those regiments in Ohio and Pennsylvania filled up, those young men came across the river and joined West Virginia Union regiments. And in, in the first two years of the war, of course, it was Virginia. People need to remember that our Union men fought under the flag of the United States listed as Virginia units. Clear up until, you know, what we celebrated, June 20th, 1863, these are still listed as Virginia regiments, not as West Virginia regiments. So remember that. Naturally, that's a fact. Until they created the state officially, those are Virginia regiments. So you had the 7th West, you know, the 7th Virginia Infantry Union fighting the 7th Virginia Regiment Confederate. Oftentimes, you'd see brother against brother in uh, regiments with the same numbers. Kind of bizarre, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, there's a common mistake that folks uh, that are thinking that all the Confederate soldiers should receive medals also. I'm just kind of wondering, what are they thinking when the medals are created by the very pro-Union government right after the war? Uh, are they going to give the Confederates medals? I don't think so. So, uh, the, uh, uh, the the common, uh, you know, interesting things that happened just last week. I found two Richard Fergusons and two Samuel Albrights, and these guys are close to the same age and close to the same counties, and of course. We have to separate which guy deserves that medal. <laughs> so you can see that it can be a very tricky situation, especially when some of these men go west and are never heard from again, or run off with the with the scullery maid, and you know they, they leave their wives and children, and nobody knows where they went. So uh, the situation is one where it's a difficult process to be sure about each soldier, especially if it's a common name, as you well know. Uh, imagine how long it takes when uh, you have to start these applications. Uh, sometimes they've lasted literally for years. People come back a year later and say, oh, I found another marriage record. Or, uh, I have found a will, and this proves that Frederick Jones was related to his father, so-and-so Jones. So you need to remember that when you get back into the 1850s and 1840s, oftentimes wills and marriages are the only records you're going to find to be able to connect your people. And if anybody is taking notes or wants to write this down, Remember the state of Virginia, which all of us here in Western Virginia uh, are included in, does not start to keep birth and death records and still, uh, until 1853. You know, it's always uh, galling to us to have somebody come in and say, well, I've got the record right here, and he was born in 1820, I've got the birth record, you know. There is no birth record for Virginia in 1820. The records for births and deaths start in 1853. Now, the uh, things like marriages and wills and deeds, they go back further. So you may need to delve back into those. And deed records oftentimes are great. It'll have, I give to my son 14 acres in, you know, Coon Creek Hollow. And that's the kind of record that can help you prove a relationship to a father or a mother. Uh, the uh, uh, problem with some folks is that when they get a name uh, and they are they are sure that their great great grandfather fought in the Civil War, why don't I have a listing for him? Why don't we have him on our medals list? And one of the reasons is he was a guerrilla. There are guerrillas, both militia on the Union side 
and various partisan rangers on the southern side that are stealing horses and shooting people in the back and burning down barns and robbing banks. And they don't want to get their names on lists. You will not find uh, many Confederate guerrillas on these lists. They did not want to be on the list. Nor did they want to have the Confederate generals tell them what to do. So uh, that happened quite often all across the southern part of our counties and in the middle part too. So, so uh, the guerrillas are, are one of those things that you know are not going to have uh, pension records and or medals. The Union side had a bunch of disreputables too that were oftentimes uh, caught uh, doing things like stealing people's uh, horses and uh, uh, many a young man was uh, captured by the Union militia and if he had bullets in his pocket or if he's carrying a gun, he could have been summarily shot, executed right there on the side of the road. Uh, people don't like to talk about that here in West Virginia, but I assure you it happened every day of the war. People were killed, murdered, hung, and the, the venomous uh, ferocity of the war is exacerbated when it's Virginian against Virginia. You have a civil war, but when you have a local civil war, it gets even worse. And it's a very brutal and uh, unfortunate situation when neighbor is opposed to neighbor. And uh, that's how we had it here in West Virginia. Uh, another interesting factor, and I'm going to uh, emphasize this, we have almost 150 medals left for African American soldiers in the 45th U.S. Colored Infantry. Uh, these men were assigned to West Virginia. We still have the lists of them. You can read the lists here. I try to help uh, African American families connect with these because we would love to be able to give some of these medals away. But imagine how hard it is for black families to try to reach back into slavery and find the names of slaves and what county they may have been in, you know, because the slaves in both the 1850 and the 1860 slave schedules do not have the names of the slaves. They only have the names of the owners, and the owners may be, you know, uh, John Russell lives in Charleston. He has uh, five slaves. They're listed as one slave woman two slave men, children, three mulattoes. I've seen a whole variety of, of, of references, but you're not going to find names of slaves. So that's a hard thing for them to prove that they've got a soldier on our list. The, uh, the, the African American soldiers can clearly be seen whenever you see the number 45th U.S. Colored Infantry. You know that if you know, that, it, that if, if that's a black soldier, probably not your man. And uh, I try to get this word out to black uh, genealogical societies, uh, African-American websites, you know, those kinds of things, but it's still a very uphill battle. And we've got a lot of those medals we would like to pass out. So uh, uh, there were only a few companies out of the 45th given to West Virginia. They were assigned to us because they were assigning various black regiments to various states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Western Virginia. Uh, that assignment uh, did not have a direct connection, but many of the soldiers in that unit would have been slaves that may have escaped from West Virginia counties, Harrison County, Greenbrier County, that kind of thing. So uh, if you know any black folks that would like to discuss that with me, I would like to talk to them about it because I'd love to give those medals away. Uh, and there are, uh, there are various new sites coming online all the time now. So sometimes it's amazing how much information pops up on the computers now. So I'm hoping we can give some of those away. Uh, remember that you can uh, possibly find your soldier uh, in uh, a very interesting place, and y'all might not know about this one. There is a veteran's grave registration 
that FDR started in the 1930s to hire people to pay them to feed their families during the Depression. This grave registration was very valuable to us now. Back then, it was mainly a, a, a jobs program, but folks went out into the local cemeteries and they found veterans' graves. These veterans' graves could have been for the Revolutionary War, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, clear up to World War I, but by Oh, by a huge number, it's mostly Civil War soldiers. And mostly it will be Union soldiers listed. So I'm just warning you there. But these are very interesting records. We have them right back there on microfilm. You can look at the microfilm, find your soldier listed, and it will tell you which cemetery he was buried in, which county he was buried at, and you then go to the county record, which is in the next tape roll, and you will see a picture of a whole series of very interesting little maps that have the Jones Cemetery and the High Lawn Cemetery and the, you know, Mount Nebo Church Cemetery. And they're right there. I've told people this now for a million years, however long I've been here, that the uh, situation is their county should come here and copy those old cemetery records. So uh, various historical societies have done so. I have personally copied them for them, but you can see the, the little maps that those people drew of each of those cemeteries even have the little veterans' graves marked and numbered on each of those little maps. So uh, the interesting part is, of course, they've got the old roads and old highways that might show you where the old cemetery is. And in the descriptions, they often say 600 miles off Route 2. I mean 600 miles. Six miles off Route 2, sorry, to get to that little cemetery. So it even has a description that might help you find an old cemetery. So I highly recommend those. And uh, we have, like I say, the microfilm right here. Anybody can show it to you. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that most of y'all know how to get on our website, and you should realize that we have birth, death, and marriage records uh, online. Very few states have it as well as we do. It's right there online. You can look them up. It's not perfect, but it is usually very accurate. And unfortunately, the birth records only go up to about 1911, something like that. And uh, the death and the marriage records go clear up to the 1970s. And they make you pay whatever it is, twelve fifty for them downtown. Here we give them to you for free. You can download a death record right at your own home for free. Our website is totally free. All the records totally free. Uh, just like the service you get here in the uh, state archives, which I recommend people visiting. Of course, we help you here, and usually the most you pay is twenty five cents for a copy. Y'all know that we're pretty good about that. Uh, when you see uh, uh, fig, uh, you know, one of the uh, names on the list that, that you might figure is your man, be sure you get the age, the birthplace, and the regimental number because those are the basic foundations you're going to use to get this thing going. The application itself is right in front of us down here. Uh, I tell people, and you may have heard me say it, that you have to go out to, you know, go at this project as you would uh, thinking of yourself as Sherlock Holmes. Many of these little mysteries can be unlocked. It's a lot of fun. Uh, add up these records, see a soldier on that list, get hold of us. I've got up here both how to apply for Civil War medals. I have the actual applications here. and. Uh, uh, I have a short history of the, of the medals themselves right there, so come, I'll pass one out. And uh, I appreciate your uh, listening to my verbosity. Thank you very much. <laughs> now let's have some questions. Anybody curious about something about the medals? Just a comment, I'll ask you for talking about the maps, 
cemetery maps. Uh -huh. I know Russell and several people have been able to mark some graves that we have lost because it tells you 11 feet south of a marked grave, three feet from this marked grave. And you know, and you go there and you find the depression. A lot of the old graves were not marked. If somebody's hunting cemetery or hunting hunting a grave that isn't marked, that's a good place to look. That that is, and, and that's and and there are a ways to apply for a, a soldier's marker if you wish mm -hmm. to apply for a marker from the Veterans Administration. And Russell has they marked uh -huh. several uh -huh. uh, that they've been able to actually get the government to give them a, uh -huh. a marker. Of course, you have to set it, but. And that's a problem because it's a heavy piece of um, marble. But uh, and y'all probably heard the old joke, you know, the the Union soldiers have a curved, rounded top for the Union soldiers' graves, but the Confederates have a pointed top so the Yankees can't sit on their tombstones. That's what they say. So you've heard that before. Uh, any other questions about who might be eligible or? Uh, I'm trying to think the procedure itself. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a comment. A lot of people don't know where their departed soldier is. Check the ground. I accidentally found my relative up there. We knew he was dead. I have a hand painted in picture of him. But nobody knew where he was buried. And it told where he was originally buried. And they do a lot of times. He was originally buried in Mr. Harvey's corn patch up here in Dupont, Bell area. And after the war, they came through in 1867, and there was somebody buried on your property, a soldier, and you didn't want them. They would exhume the body, and if the family didn't know about it, they took them to ground. Huh. And we have those records. Yeah, we, and we have a list of the soldiers that are buried. And this is the National Cemetery. And then it says uh, unknown on a lot of them because it, it would describe this guy's, it would give him a name and it would say he had on white gloves. But by the time they came to exhume the body, I'm sure they weren't white anymore. And they would tell whether his head was pointed north, south, east, or west so they could kind of identify who this person was. So we have those. And uh, we also have uh, the listings for if you're a veteran, like my great great uncle was uh, in the 7th West Virginia Cavalry. He was captured and he died in, uh, in Andersonville, like many of our prisoners did. He died in Andersonville. And I can go, I haven't done it yet, but I want to go look at his grave there in Andersonville. Each grave has a number, and the listing is on the on our list, so you can see the Andersonville graves also. There's a picture in a book over here of a piece of flooring from Andersonville where they took something sharp and cut a checkerboard into the floor huh. so they can have something to do. <laughs> huh. uh, I was trying to think of anything that would be uh, of interest to the Civil War history you can see here. Uh, you don't have to go to the National Archives to get the soldier's muster cards, which are his month-by-month -month military history. These are not the pension records. You do have to go to the National Archives to get the pension records. And they're very expensive now. I think like 75 bucks to get the, the pension records now. But here you can get all the muster cards for just a couple of dollars. And the muster cards, I think, are the more interesting as far as military records go. Uh, it'll say, you know, got drunk, got demoted from corporal to private, you know, or uh, 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 deserted, and, and then the next card it'll say, uh, came back two months later, you know. He deserted when, he, when it was time to go plant the corn, and then he came back, you know, when, it, when that planting was over. So that's true for many soldiers. The Confederate records are also here. Every single Confederate Virginian is here listed. And all you need to do to look up his records is to find the Confederate's name right here on the alphabetical order books of the Confederate listings. And 
All you need is his name and his regiment number. So they're right here if you have a confederate. Well, thanks a lot, folks. Uh, we're, uh, we're here all the time. Thursday night we're open late. I advise you to come and utilize your state archives before it disappears. <laughs> One day they'll want it to all be online. And uh, for some reason, I'm partial to these things that people are no longer interested in. They're called books. And we've got a lot of them, folks. And uh, they're useful, and uh, they're even fun. And you do not need electricity. Uh, you can even use candles if you wanted to read that book. So uh, I'm just teasing you about that. but. You know, not everything is going to be online, and you're going to lose, as several of us, uh, I'm retiring in exactly 20 days, uh, I'm retiring on Halloween night, <laughs> and I've had a good time here, and I've seen many of you many times, and uh, you need to realize that as these good folks go, you're going to be losing a qualitative ability to transfer the history of your state over to you. And I'm afraid that some people won't even know us when we're gone. They won't even remember. The problem is we've got a lot of good information that will be fading away. It's not all going to be online on some digital process. Come in here and see the actual records. Come get a hold of uh, photographs and actual, uh, actual information that uh, I think is in a form that I think is more interesting. Here, you can call for your man's regimental rolls, and you can see the actual muster rolls with your great-great-grandfather's name written by an officer right there on the rolls, and you can see the actual one that they had in camp. Could have been a rainy night outside of Gettysburg, and they were taking the roll. So uh, you can see the actual markings. You will never see that online, folks. You'll never be able to hold it in your hand. So uh, I advocate you come take a look at it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Thanks a lot. I'm going to pass out some of these maps that are good because they have uh, they have the whole Midland Trail uh, on them, and they're really good maps. In case y'all hadn't had a chance to see one of these maps. They're good and they're free and they're fun. Take a look at those. There you go. Have a Midland Trail map. There you go. There you go. Have one. You probably already got one, but I'll give you one. I just found a wonderful website online. Muncie Maps. I can't remember what it was. I downloaded a from from the late 1700s yeah. up to current. Local maps. Huh? Maps, I mean, big files. Yep. For free. Huh. Beautiful. What do you need? Beautiful. To, you need to send us the link so I'll we can tell people. I just people found about, last. Yeah. Like four last. Uh -huh. But that's fun, isn't it? Oh. And can you blow things up on it? And they, have, they have like eight sizes that you huh. can pick from. A thumbnail up to extra, extra, huh. extra large, huh. and it takes about 10 minutes for one of them to download as fast as my computer is. They're massive. And but it's still magical. It? It's gorgeous. <laughs> it's like magic. And you, you can bring them up on your computer and you can see all the little creeks and all the little huh. names. Uh -huh. And I'm getting ready to do a, teach a class of him. Huh. And you can use that up right there. I on was your, needing your to show them how to uh -huh. progress through the counties. Uh -huh. you but know. you could project that if you had a little digital to. projector. Yeah, huh? that's what we'll do. Yeah, here's right. a Texas Tech man here. <laughs> but he's a, gonna be a good ball. That should be I a hope. good guy. He's hoping. Yeah. He's hoping. The only thing Texas that's Tech has a chance is if this if the Mountaineers have a letdown after beating those Longhorns. Well, you know a coach. Okay. Oh, well, he knows. He knows what kind of offense you got. <laughs> he knows what kind of offense he's got. Folks, uh, up here are. Uh, I'm going to pass these out just because y'all are here. I want to give you a small explanation of the medals, and that'll let you see those. Take one of those. 
these little explanations uh, give you some extra information about the levels right there. And uh, it has another picture inside there for metals too, but that talks all about the production of them. And uh, there's one right there. There you go.